we're going to uh, get started. Thank you for coming. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to have uh, Mark coming all the way from Virginia Beach to come and talk to us this morning and share some of his wisdom. This is the business development group. I think most of you have already been here at least once, so you know what we are about. We're about uh, business education to local business owners. The idea is uh, we're presenting high caliber of speakers to introduce people to new or existing concepts to help you uh, build your business, sustain your business, and hopefully grow and grow the local community. This is our calendar of events. Today is what makes possible uh, branding. And uh, we're taking a break for spring break. So the first, uh, first Tuesday in April, we're, we're off, but we'll be back with a vengeance to talk about something that is uh, high on a lot of people's mind is social media. What is it? I think we know pretty much what it is, but how do I use it without basically spending my life close to my computer? Uh, and then we're going to have some other sessions coming up. Uh, community involvement. We had to talk a little bit about legal, how to get out of legal entanglement. And we'll finish about talking about CPA as small businesses. We need to get help from other sources. We try to do it all ourselves, but we probably can't. At some point, you'll, you need to have help from a CPA. And they'll come and tell us when is that a good time and how to choose a good CPA. Thank you to our sponsors, primarily to uh, First Advantage for letting us use this uh, this room, and uh, some of our other sponsors here who put their time and effort uh, to put this uh, series together. And Mark, well, Mark came to branding through industrial design. He actually uh, started designing musical instruments, I believe, uh, string instruments. So if you're into music, maybe you want to talk to him afterwards. Uh, and uh, through this work with musical instruments and manufacturing of them, he really started having a passion. Good morning, Barbara. Having a passion for branding. And since the 1990s, he's been helping large and small corporations with their product branding, their image. Um, you probably knew Mark before you actually knew knew him. Some of his uh, big. Uh, I actually recognize the Nauticus brand is quite distinctive. Well, he's the father of the Nauticus design. He also worked on other uh, well-known uh, designs such as, such as Colonial Web and Maxon's. And he has an impressive list of achievements that he probably will talk about throughout his presentation with some uh, patterns. He's developed over 80 corporate identities. 222, nice number of products and brands. He's been involved with four museums, I guess Nautica's being one of them. Then what were the other three? Okay. Everything around the water. Okay. And also involved with the National Link of uh, five uh, startup companies. So it's my distinct pleasure and honor to uh, introduce to you Mark. You will talk about profitable marketing. What's the difference between mediocre and stellar marketing? If you have a clear purpose, then for a clear purpose, you're going to get a good design, and profit will trigger trickle from there. If you have got the corporate identity, it also brings value. You'll talk about the evolution of a design system to integrate how the design uh, is integrated with the marketing and also cover the relationship between the company name, its purpose, and what's in it for the customers. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, there's almost nothing I'd rather, almost nothing I'd rather talk about than uh, this particular subject because um, I've, I've been a designer since my youth. Um, I think it all started when I was about eight, seven, or eight. I went up in the attic in the fourth story of our house 
and built a rain-making machine. And um, my mother had this interesting wine bottle that had shaped kind of like an electrical uh, conductor of some sort. So I put it in a box and uh, put it in the window. And, uh, and I waited for it to rain. And after a couple of days, it did. And I got a tremendous amount of reinforcement and idea generation and product development at that point. <laughs> I was sold, and I've been doing uh, product development ever since. So yesterday, my wife uh, came to me just before supper time, and she said, I did get you some, um, some, some niacin to try. And I said, niacin, really? OK, is it the no flush kind? You know, I'm flushing niacin. She said, yeah, it's the no flush kind. I picked it up at Costco, good price. It's supposed to be a really good brand. So I took one. And then at supper time, I said, did you, did you put cayenne in, in the supper? Because my face feels like I'm full of cayenne. My body is systemically full of cayenne. She said, uh, she's no cayenne. She said, but you had red spots all over your face. <laughs> and I said, oh, good. Because I have to give a lecture tomorrow morning. <laughs> and uh, I do want people to see my points, but I don't want them to see my spots. <laughs> so, so she said, uh, well, drink a lot of water. And I did. And fortunately, today, the spots went, went away with the points. Please to tell you why I'm still here. <laughs> so, uh, that, that does kind of relate. You may be wondering how that's germane to our discussion today, but it does relate because sometimes we can look a certain way in business and we really don't know that we look that way, or if we do, we, we know that we don't want to look that way. And uh, we don't certainly don't want people to think of us as spotted in any sense. I mean, we don't want them to think about the companies in the same way. So what people see, as you all well know, by their attention to press and everything else, is very important. So what makes profitable branding? This would be the question that I'd like to address today. Because it's one thing just to, to brand a company. Still another to spend what some people regard as being an arm and a leg on branding companies can be very expensive. It would take nine months to two years. Uh, to do the job right. A lot of people don't know that. It's not just something that happens over uh, the course of a few days. But um, if you spend all that money and you identify your company and you don't understand what the ROI is on that, how it's profitable in any sense, then why would you do that? So these are uh, particularly acute questions in an economy where who has any money spent on branding? And, and why would you? So I, I hope to, to give you enough evidence today that it's well worth its cost um, because of its profitability. Hard thing to measure because it's on the sub subjective side of profit. It's not a certain percentage that comes off sales. So where is the asset value in branding is what we'd like to look at today. But, but here's the first point in answer to the question what makes profitable branding. Without business performance, nothing will make profitable branding. You can't use branding to make a company successful if the performance isn't there, the management isn't in place, isn't in place. The, uh, the basic concept of how a company will move from its product or services to its sales, all these things, if there are image issues, um, branding can help. But without performance, nothing will actually make profitable branding. But with performance, uh, there's a lot of asset value that comes with the development of a corporate identity system. Um, if people really do understand the purpose of the company and its purpose relates to uh, the satisfaction of some basic need that they have, then that will convert to profit. And as a result of that, there will be growth. Uh, implicit in the question, what makes profitable branding is this makes unprofitable branding. And uh, that, this, in some respects, to start our, our discussion in the right direction, is a more important than the other one. Because many people don't realize that what they, the, the visual and verbal cues that they make to all the different audiences that a company can speak to, all those messages can be without meaning, without purpose, 
and especially without profit. So why would you spend any money or attention on unprofitable brand? And yet everybody who puts a sign up, so to speak, or enters a, a yellow page ad or uh, puts a header on the internet uh, hopes that something will relate to that communication in the form of um, the bottom line <coughs> profits. So what is it that makes unprofitable branding even if the company had good performance? What is it? Well, first, the common name. I was driving down the road the other day, and uh, I took a picture of Billy the Plumber, the back of his truck, because not only was Billy the Plumber just another Billy driving down the road, but his message was so confusing and haphazard on the the van that it took me a while to figure out that Billy was a plumber. And I don't think he had a phone number there. Uh, so there was no basis of communication. What Billy thought he was doing with the, 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 the few square inches of vinyl that he put on the back of his van was completely unprofitable to him. Who's going to remember Billy? You know, the, the irony is, I did. <laughs> so Billy was so boring and so routine and regular that he stood out. Uh, the thing is, how, if, if, if you look at how many businesses in the yellow pages start with double A or triple A, or one guy named his company four A, and they put him in the S, uh, he thought he was going to be the four A, the number one company, wound up in the S and uh, counteracted his whole green idea, but. Common names don't really do anything for you because they're not memorable. The whole idea of a name is to, to create an instant impression that is very difficult to forget. That's why I changed my company name, which used to be um, Jordana Designs. People used to come to me and say, great designer name, Italian. You know, it sounds like a designer. The problem is people don't know what to do with the G, I, O, and the R in rapid succession together in one word followed by a D-A-N-O, they, they look at that and they can't pronounce it. So I did a, 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 uh, an intercept survey in the mall, and I asked people to read my name, only to discover <coughs> that half the people I asked didn't want to try. The name was so formidable in its spelling, and the ones that tried, half of those mispronounced it. They couldn't read it at all. So then, just to make my point to myself, I, I, I said, well, who is going to remember my company? In a world where uh, we have so many crowded messages and so many different kinds of things to remember and names and companies, um, I propose to um, be able to help people with the retention from names, if nothing else, or distinction from names, or a trademark that will stand out, and yet people can't even remember my name. So I went from Giordano Designs to Mint Designs. Um, big change, and that uh, I've proven several times over. Once people encounter the name in a way that, that there's some kind of mental involvement, um, they don't forget it instead of that they can't remember it. The reverse is true now. Um, and that, that, you know, over the last 20 years of Mint Design's existence, that has come home to me in many different ways. So a common name uh, is going to be unprofitable. A meaningless logo is a logo that looks like clip art. Um, why is that unprofitable? Because Clip art, by its nature, is either free or cheap. So do you want people to think of your company as being either free or cheap? So what happens is a logo isn't art in and of itself that, that just conveys a thought. A logo becomes a shorthand representation of your company. So if the logo looks cheap, people without being cognizant of it will relate the logo to your company Think that the company is cheap because the way the logo looks. On the other hand, if the logo doesn't look cheap, then they will think the company has some substance to it. We're going to get into this at length today, and you'll see exactly how this works. Um, absent a tagline, I've seen a lot of companies that really haven't given any thought to a tagline. You can have a tagline that doesn't mean anything, and it may well not be there because the words aren't really doing what the tagline is supposed to. We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Appreciated communication falls into the same category, but it goes into collateral marketing materials. Um, I once asked one of my clients at the inception of our, uh, of our work together to, to give, get me a box and put in the box all the brochures of his competitors around town. 
He's an HVAC company. And uh, so he gives me this box. He didn't bother looking. He had somebody go collect the brochures, put them in the box, and brought them to me. I pulled them out. They were all the same brochure. The only difference was some, the, the name had been stamped of the particular individual companies on the back. Somebody had gone down the road in all the HVAC companies and sold them an HVAC brochure. And so the net result was you couldn't tell the difference between them. How would any company like that propose to stand out? This went somewhat past the idea of being cliché, uh, but you get the point. If, if what you say, uh, excellent company, skill, integrity, it sounds the same as what everybody else says, uh, there's not going to be a whole lot of profitability in the communication. Uh, purposeless design. This is design that has no reflection in what the, the purpose and the values of the company are, to say nothing of what those pur that purpose and those values will mean in the minds of people that you would hope to uh, either communicate with or sell to. And finally, uh, and I think most importantly, no perception planning. Uh, the word design means to plan. I named my company Mint Design because Mint stands for, lots of different things, stands for fresh, and so I'm interested in, in producing fresh ideas. It stands for original, something that's in mint condition is original, and we only do original art in mint design. And also it's a place where money is made. If you put fresh, original, and the idea of profitability in the planning, then the planning should produce those three goals, which are embodied in the name of my company, Mint Design. Why, why that name exists, aside from the fact that it's a simple word for you to remember. So the point is a properly designed identity uh, actually exceeds its value the day it's done. You say you spent $20,000 on an identity, which is a low figure in this business. Banks will spend anywhere from half a million to a million dollars. Uh, Coca-Cola spends at uh, one point uh, $3 million in 1973 just to revamp its identity, and, and it can go up from there, but why why would companies spend that much money? And how could I say if you spend twenty thousand dollars on an identity that it exceeds its value, which at that point is its cost the day it's done? Why why would I say such a thing? Well think of it like this. When an automobile is on the assembly line, what is it worth? Before it's been tuned and the steering wheel's on it. And it's, there's a few pieces that say there's no dashboard in it. What will the car be worth? Not really worth its value at that point. When it's done and it's pristine and it moves from the factory to the lot, it has the highest value it will ever have. And that value will exceed the cost of its parts and its manufacture the day it's done. The, the idea of a car is you get in it. And it takes you someplace. It's not too dissimilar to a company. The idea is you know, drive a company and it takes you somewhere. It takes your customers somewhere too, someplace where you want to go. The only difference between a car that costs $20,000 and an identity that costs $20,000 is both of them exceed their value the day they're done. But in the next five years, the car will lose its value and the identity will gain, double, triple, quadruple its value. And that's a tall claim, but I will prove to you today that that is true. Uh, when Mint Design was started in 1990, um, I had intellectual knowledge of that, uh, that concept. Now, 20 years later, and so many companies down the road um, have experienced from my experience. I've actually seen this happen. And nothing makes me lie down and sleep with a smile on my face more than to have one of my customers actually grow at the rate that I've seen some of them grow. But once again, not to minimize the importance of performance. So, again, just to, to, to press the question, why do smart people in big companies spend good money on a unique brand? Look at this. No one looks like the other. You notice that, right? They all stand out, and they have two things going on. They have words and pictures, because we have two sides of our brain. Take most of the information that we do through our eyes. Our eyes are very important in, in pictorial recognition. Put that together with the cognitive side of the way we think, the words that mean something to us, like a bank, a technology.
technology to support that system. Uh, we're Windows 7, we're Amtrak, we're Google, and suddenly now we are engaged in every respect in the way that our minds think completely, and thereby we have a better attention, a better impression made, and from that, the, the idea of encapsulating all that these companies represent in these two little things uh, basically hits home. It works. So that's why they do it, because it pays. There wouldn't be any other reason why all these smart people spend so much money on identity. Uh, if you don't believe me, let me give you one of the most uh, interesting facts about branding I've ever seen. Mexico was rebranded by a uh, black company around the turn of the millennium. And uh, it's just, just to make a very interesting story short, it had a 77.9 increase in sales after the rebranding. It was still the star, but the star was changed to have a negative T in the middle. It was simplified, it was updated. It, it didn't look like that old Texaco dinosaur that was sort of a, a failing fossil uh, fuel. Now it looked like uh, a company that was was on the same level as Exxon's, you know, the, the Exxon and Esso, and Shell, the way they developed the color system in the Shell, and this beautiful iconic Shell that represented uh, the name because it was a picture of the same thing as the name. All these things play into it. Texaco had to do it, and when they did, their design system included uh, a change of the logo, their signage, their packaging, their promotional materials, their advertising and media, and their naming system. And they had food stores and, um, and, and lots of branding to be done. But that explains when you look at the whole complex and what was done, what was applied to all the perceptions related, you, you can understand how they would have this. But it's still so dramatic a statement of profitability and branding um, that you know, it just, it's astonishing, really. 77.9. So, so how does that work? How did they do that? Somebody just sit down with Adobe Photoshop and, and they say, you know, I know how to use Adobe. So we're going to get a good logo for you. <coughs> it doesn't happen. I, I was actually in a, in a trade show one time. And um, people came up and I had examples of things. And they came up and they said, whoa, what software do you use? Do you have Adobe? And I find the second day I came in there and put a sign on the table. It's not the software, folks. It's like going up to a painter and saying, what brush is that? How do you do that? What brush are you using to paint that painting? I was going to say, well, give me a brush. I don't care what the brush it is. It's not really the brush that does it. It's just a tool. And that's all Adobe is. Um, but unfortunately, we live in a world where people think that if they can use the software, they can brand the company. Um, that just doesn't happen. But how does it work? The presentation is going to cover three things in the remaining time. How much time do I have left? About a half hour? Yes. Okay, that should work. Um, identity basics, we'll go over that very quickly. Uh, the value of purpose in design and um, an example of how a, a, a logo is designed well, what, what goes into that. A lot of people just don't know. There's a bit of a mystery there. I will show you step by step so you get an understanding of the difference between clip art and real design. And, um, and then the third part, um, what makes profitable growth? I'm going to give you three examples of, examples of companies that I've worked with uh, where there was uh, profitable growth as a direct result of branding. It wasn't dependent on the branding, but it also couldn't have taken place without it. So let's have a look at identity basics first. These two terms are frequently used interchangeably by many people, image and identity. They actually mean several, two different things. So to clarify, your image is what people think of you regardless uh, of, of what you want them to think. This is, is, is some of, there's a poem my dad used to, used to tell me in my life, um, where the punchline in, I think, two or three verses is, oh, the gift the gear yes, to see ourselves, the gear yes. Um, that's sort of a Gaelic pronunciation, the gift the giver gives us to see ourselves as others see us. A uh, very difficult thing to do, as you know. Um, so that's that's where image is. And you have an image issue. If people perceive you or your company or your products or services as something other than what you want them to, that's an image issue, especially if they see it 
uh, in a negative light. Identity, on the other hand, which is where the term corporate identity comes from, is what you do to control that perception. It, it basically utilizes control over all the components in a, a company's design and communication system that can be controlled, the things that can't be, but taking you deliberate control of everything, all the components that can be controlled is what your corporate identity system is. The term corporate identity was coined in 1964 by uh, two partners in New York who were industrial designers uh, by the name of Lippincott and Yvonne Ruiz. It's now the biggest identity firm in the country. If you were to go to Lippincott.com, you would see every company that is anything in the world. Uh, and these people understand their business very well. Um, I've done a lot of research into uh, what makes companies like that tick, how they think, how they operate, and so I offer it on a, on a local level without um, the, the cost of Madison Avenue uh, identity design. Uh, pretty much the same thing. That's the way I practice, the way the larger companies do. Another two terms are branding and corporate identity. Branding is the perception of quality. Um, it can be, be, depending on which way you're going, if you're the company, it's the assurance of quality. If um, you're a drinker of Welsh's grape juice and you don't want any other brand but Welsh's because you like the taste, and it's been that way all your life since you were little, now you're in your 50s, and you're just going to get Welsh's. Uh, for me, it's Bailey's Coffee Creamer. If you open my refrigerator door, I've got an assortment of Bailey's, and I don't use Coffee Mate or anything else. And I know when I pick up a bottle, I don't care if it's French, um, vanilla or caramel or hazelnut, Bailey's is going to taste the way I want that creamer to taste. And so Bailey's has, has, has done its job because not only you have a beautiful label, that label to me means the cream is not going to have any bitter aftertaste. It's going to have just the right blend of cream and milk to make my fresh coffee taste exactly what I want it to. So that is what branding is at its best. Corporate ID is the control of the communication that enhances that perception. All right, so just a few basics here. In any identity system that is complete, aside from collaterals and, and, and the way you treat all the applications of that identity, something has to go on as many things in your <coughs> communication array as it can. Uh, and they're, they're made up of, of several components that have a purpose. Underneath all that is this. There's the logo, which is the visual component. It identifies the company by a visual symbol. This appeals to a very important part of the brain. It has to do with two critical things in corporate communication, retention, uh, in, in impression, and retention. An impression is made somehow, and then whatever that impression is, it's retained and associated with the eye. So there's a visual identifier that goes into the eyes. There's a verbal identifier that works with the cognitive side of your brain. Um, and that has two basic parts to it, kind of like a proper name and a common name, or a first name and a last name uh, for individuals, uh, which creates distinction. In, in the world of trademarks, you really don't get a trademark on a name that has no distinction. So st distinction is the name of the game. That is how your name, Kellogg's, stands out from the other cereals, Post, and Barbers, or whatever, on the shelf. If it looks different, or if it's, if it's Kodak, Kodak doesn't mean anything. It has no counterpart in the English language. Then in the 1800s, it can mean a brownie camera. And uh, in the 100 years later, it can mean digital color systems. Because Kodak means what Kodak wants it to mean. You see how a name works. Very easy to, to spell. <coughs> Nobody can mispronounce it. Easy to read. And it's now been working for that company for over 100 years. That's the distinct name. Kodak cameras is the descriptive name. So in my case, it's mint, the distinctive name, and design. The name has two parts. A lot of people skip this part, and they just say business paper <coughs> systems. Color copiers incorporated uh, without putting anything distinct. So there's nothing that enables that company to stand out as being distinct from its competitors. This goes directly into position marketing yourselves a lot more involved in saying what you're not in positioning or saying what you are that the others can't produce, how you're unique. But it starts with the uniqueness of the name. 
Uh, then there's the key line, or around here we will say tagline, uh, which in my view should be speaking now from the audience's perspective, from your customer's perspective. It's, an, it's the one opportunity to put a, a benefit instead of a feature, uh, along with the logo and the name of the company everywhere present. So for example, when Coca-Cola made a mistake and changed the taste, and people start suing Coke, and everybody's life was over because now they've, they've, they've changed the tastes and I can't drink it anymore. They came back with a shape of a bottle on uh, the, a red circle like the bottle cap, and underneath it they put the theme on, always Coca-Cola, which was an inherent promise, we will never change it again. And that worked. So you can use a tagline uh, for a lot of different things. This doesn't change, this doesn't change, but this can be changed. This is a changing communication. It's a it's a one shorthand place to put everywhere present in your communication a benefit, a key benefit, to your customers. So that's the audience identifier. And then each company, these components will add asset value when they're done right. All right. So now we're going to move into another area of, of reasoning. As an individual, how did you get your value? Assuming all of us were born into this world one day, we asked, more or less. We didn't really have anything to do with the end of this world. We're just here. Somebody once wrote a book, Feed Me, I'm here. Is that how you got your value as an individual? Let's say you had a good upbringing. Maybe your parents instilled value. And that is now uh, part of your life. You're standing on your shoulders. Let's say you had a bad upbringing. And in spite of all that, you have reinvented yourself and assigned some value. But how, where did that value come from? I'll tell you exactly where it came from. At some point in your life, you started thinking, who am I and what will I offer to this world? Well, what is the meaning of my life where other people are concerned? And you thought about it and deliberately assigned purpose and value to who you are as an individual. And if you now have value, as it's as a result of that deliberate assignment. You see what I'm saying? It didn't come haphazardly. You just, so there are ways in which we can have value uh, in this world from something that happens to us. But that will only happen if we, again, respond by deciding to, to uh, incorporate that as, as a value to who we are as individuals. So if you would do this with yourself, why wouldn't you assign a similar kind of value purpose to your company? You know, that's a question that is answered on its face. You would. Of course you would. If you would dress yourself a certain way in order to create a certain impression, why would you not do the same thing with your company? So I want to look at a, at a case study here to show you how value and purpose come together in design, how they really drive real design, and you cannot do that with clip art. Uh, so we'll look at the logo asset. In uh, a recent job that I did um, for a group, a networking group, uh, which came into the name 50K Club, when we were first talking about it, they said, we'll call our, ourselves a $50,000 club. And I went, time out. Come on. Because and, and there's a very practical reason for the difference between a $50,000 club and the 50K Club. If you put it on the side of a truck on, on uh, an internet header, uh, website header, there's a distinct difference between the size of the letters that it can be to describe $50,000 club, which kind of sounds like a washing machine falling down a staircase, and 50K in, in three letters. 3M is one of the best ever. And when you go to St. Paul, Minnesota and look at the 3M building from about five miles off, you can clearly read the letters on the top of the building. If it said Minnesota Mining and Manufacture, you, you wouldn't be able to do that. Neither would IBM with International Business Machine. As a matter of fact, if they answered the phone, International Business Machine, People say, I'm sorry, I have the wrong number, and I have to call IBM. See what I'm saying? So IBM got to be distinct over time. International, international business machines um, is just a bit long. So 50K was the objective. And how do we get a logo out of that that has value? So this is what I want to show you in, in the real development of, of, of true design. Uh, when I go for any kind of logo, I start with either a square or a circle. Why is that? because there's a direct relationship in proportion between having the dimension of vertically and horizontally be the same. So you're there in an equilateral triangle, square or circle. 
with those proportions. Uh, squares of circles are the more obvious, more common place to go. But I start there because when I use this logo on the side of a truck or on the left side of a, uh, or on the left chest up here, I want, I don't want to be constrained too much by a vertical or a horizontal uh, proportion, which you can be, and it can, it can affect the readability of signs which go on trucks and all the other things that get to be used. It's, it's not always a limitation, but it can be. So I want it to be the best it can be, so I start with a circle or a square. And I'm looking basically for vertical and horizontal symmetry. All right, so that's where I start. But that's not enough. That's just shape and proportion. Where am I going to get substance in an, in an icon that I use to represent a company? So I start with, with sketches. Um, in this case, I thought it was kind of interesting that we were talking about a networking group which links people together somehow in business. And the five and the zero both having circles in them, I thought, well, there you are. There's a little substance. I can link them together. And so I, I just started sketching little linked shapes with a 5, a 0, and a K. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is a real sophisticated executive network group. Does that logo address the style that you would want to see as associating with a sophisticated network group? And I, I didn't really feel like it did. Uh, I felt like I was going in a good direction with the concept of linking, and that would be substance and purpose enough to start, but I wasn't satisfied with the way they looked. Nevertheless, just to check it to be sure, I, I, I went in the direction of, of trying to get this to look a little bit more formal in style. So this was my first attempt, and I could have stopped there. I said, all right, there you go. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, how distinct is that? Well, it's distinct in that the five and the zero link uh, uh, with each other, but still just a 5 and 0 K artistically rendered. Um, and that, to me, falls short of my goal as making a real distinct mark. So linking business, I could stop there, but I wanted to go and look at it again, see if I could drive the design into a more distinct visual image. So I, I took a modern approach. I looked at, and this has a lot to do with font style. I took a classic approach. I haven't really designed anything yet except to, to work out this arrangement of letters. Uh, I took a casual approach and a formal calligraphic approach, and I did this one. What interests me the most is this clearly reads as a five, but it's a real different kind of five. So if I have a different kind of networking group, and I assign a different kind of five in the name of that group, now I'm starting to pull a consistency in what I'm trying to show. Distinction, both in, in terms of what this group is intrinsically, and distinction in the way it portrays itself by the design. So I, I tried one more. I'm still looking around. And I noticed um, in, in all of these that the five has the K has an extension, which I thought could relate somehow to the zero. So I moved it over and put it inside the zero. And uh, this, again, is calligraphic. It's kind of like the other one. The five is a little bit more distinct as a five. And I started looking at this. And this is what, to me, is this fascinating part of design. I'm thinking, where have I seen that before? It's not looking just like a 50K. It's like something else. And she goes, well, I know I've seen that, because I've done a lot of work with shapes and things, uh, historical things. And so I don't know what that is. That's a five. You may have already recognized it. Um, it's particularly interesting because phi has its root in a lot of really interesting things in design. Wait and see. So that threw me into what became the evolution of the final design because of the interest I had in phi, which means, incidentally, uh, faithful. And it, it comes from the, the, a Greek word. Um, Fidelis is the Roman counterpart of the Greek word, and uh, you know Semper Fi, the marine uh, mantra, which means always faithful. Um, but in business, uh, fidelity means faithfulness in business. You would start to think, well, what's that exactly? Uh, how is a company faithful to its customers? What makes customers a faithful company? So the idea of, of business faithfulness was very intriguing to me because now we have uh, triggered from a K and a zero, a phi symbol, and a meaning that has considerably uh, more substance 
than when I started with on just a linking concept. Um, it happens that the rate, this is the golden ratio, and that ratio is 1.618. It's the relationship of these two, two lines together to the whole. Um, let me explain to you what phi is in a way that would be very simple to understand. It has two parts in this proportion, extreme and mean, the longer and the shorter. Two quantities are in the golden ratio. The ratio of the sum of the quantities to the larger quantity is equal to the ratio of the larger quantity to the smaller <laughs> one. Now that I've explained that, aren't you glad that I did? Yes, because I know you're sitting there and thinking, can we please yeah. talk about something else? <laughs> this is like getting way, way over anything I want to consider today. Never mind this thing that looks like uh, pi on steroids. Just, just leave this alone. Uh, it's not important to get into all that. It's just that it's there's only one ratio in the universe that does this, and it's phi. And it's it's this everywhere. particular golden mean that makes this particular rectangle. Um, it's the golden rectangle, and you can construct it by taking a square, bisecting the square, drawing a, a, a radian from the, that point to the corner, and then drawing an arc, and that will be at the one. 0.618 point, if you make a rectangle by adding that section on, you have what's called historically the golden rectangle. Watch where this goes. Where have I seen that before? Yes, that's the proportion that goes to the television sets. And that's not the only place you can find this thing. Let me show you a little more about how this is constructed. You can construct it from circles. You can construct it from triangles. See that equilateral triangle placed in a circle produces a phi relationship. Um, you can construct it from a hexagon and look at all the relationships in there that come out to be represented of that particular proportion. It also has another unique characteristic, and that is it relates to uh, a mathematical formula called the Fibonacci curve, which if you run this as an arc from one point to the other in a square and then continue it, it, it creates a spiral shape. Now, you say, so how does this relate to anything germane to our discussion about branding? Watch where this goes. It happens to be the basic shape in galaxies, hurricanes, waves, the copia of the ear, DNA, DNA helix, and particle counts. Yes. Um, there's somebody, this is internet stuff, this is copies. Somebody found it in one of the hurricanes. Look at that. Um, it's there in the, the, uh, the chamber of Nautilus. Uh, it's all over geometry. People have observed it in historical architecture. Why it comes up repeatedly in the pyramid, in the Taj Mahal, and in the uh, Parthenon. Uh, they've observed it in, in human beings, and people have spent their lives studying the proportional relationships of human beings to this particular uh, formula uh, of, of the proportion of phi. Uh, it's also in logos. Um, and you know, once you start looking at these things, saying, "Man, this is an interesting thing." As a designer, it interests me because you're always saying, "Where do I put this?" Usually, if you put it someplace and you go, "That looks good," go back and analyze it. It's in that proportion somehow. I don't know why that is. It just is. Um, it's called the uh, construction of the universe. It's called the intelligent design of the universe. If you will, but there's something there. So let's look at phi and 50k. Uh, this then gave me a basis for producing a good design that I felt would be unique. So you have the phi symbol. I've got two golden rectangles that I then made this work within. Uh, that's the, the, the framework for this design. So there's the extension of the K, and there's my 0 and 50. If I, I went back to this calligraphic phi, and said, so what happens if I take that, uh, make an ellipse out of the golden rectangle right there in the center of this, make an O out of that, Put the i in the center of that, take the, the k. Did you see what I did? I took the phi and just turned it upside down and mirror image it the other way. Mm -hmm. Now I have an interesting k shape, don't I? Put all three of them together, and I have out of this basically this, this phi driven design framework uh, a very interesting configuration for a phi of zero and k. It wasn't quite formal enough for me for the networking group, but I'm heading in a very nice formal direction. So uh, I, I analyzed it. every part of this according to this. And you know, as a designer, you can make adjustments to make all this work, thinking that that will add to it. I put phi everywhere in this thing. Uh, in the 50K, these are just different iterations. There's the, the 50K with the K distinct. There's the, the uh, uh, 50K with the phi distinct. Uh, there it is in gold or in green, in other words, money. Uh, if I notice that if I take this same shape, I just create a C. Club. You 
you see what level of distinction we have here? This didn't just happen. This happened by deliberate intent, driving and driving on the design. Um, so how does this relate to, to branding? Well, it should convey something about the purpose, which we conveniently have already embodied in the meaning of the of by and faithfulness. So let's get how this works out in, uh, in for a networking group. If you take the Latin terms, res and fidelis, which means business fidelity, and then take the definition of phi, look at what you have, truthfulness and accuracy, accuracy in reporting details of facts. Let's say that's the basis, the vision for your business. Uh, loyalty to an organization of principle, not only the companies themselves, but to the networking group that this embodies. Oops. Uh, frequency, clarity, and accuracy of output is in, in um, stereo. But what if this is, is the way your company works? It's, it's always clear, but it does, it does frequently, clearly. And it, it's accurate in all the communication output, all the service output, all the ways in which it does business. Um, and exact correspondence with fact or given quality or event, lasting support. I didn't write this. This came out of a dictionary, out of various definitions that I compiled from the word phi. So that, to me, seemed like we've got all the substance you could hope for now in identifying this organization. And that result being the PK club standing for business fidelity. And I started thinking, well, what would be our theme line? And came up with several options in proportion to profit. Business in proportion to integrity. Profit in proportion to promise. Profit in proportion to integrity. Business in profit proportion. And so on and so forth. You see how that would work. Um, then I started wondering how would we apply this in a networking group where we want to be identified uh, with visually as being a member of an organization in a non-selling uh, circumstance. So I'm thinking pins, lapel pins, tie pins, cufflinks, uh, perhaps a, a ring, and what would it look like? And that's the basis for putting it in a circle. Um, and I thought, you know, I, I could actually design those things as well. That's how it turned. Industrial designers get involved with branding because once you have this, it has to be applied. A lot of things that can turn three-dimensional pretty quick. So, um, it may seem like a tall, tall order to tell you about these three companies in the next 10 minutes, but it won't be. Is that the time that I have, or am I out? No, you can do it. So, I can make this go fast. Uh, I want to give you three examples that I have personally experienced in profit, profitable branding. Um, web Technologies, Nautilus, and Mr. Go Glass. Example number one is Nautilus. When I came to the Nautilus project in 1999, they had this as the visual identifier. It's not really a logo, but it looks like a logo because it's artistic. It's really stencil ship letters with a woodcut of the sea behind it, and their, their tagline was Exploring the Power of the Sea. At that time, Nautilus was, this has meant nothing to the impression people had of the facility, and people were saying, let's just turn it into a fish market because it's in debt. The city expropriated it from its foundation. It was a serious trouble. It was a big issue around Norfolk, a big image issue, and I was called in to help them with it as a result of that. Um, I was also thinking about by then, then too. So I took what I knew was part of a wave, uh, wave the turbulence in waves physically reduces to a uh, Fibonacci formula um, in the ideal. Anyway, this, these are super string tags, and they're in, in helical form. This is the cochlea of an ear. That's the cochlea of an ear of an animal. That's a chambered nautilus. Uh, you can see the spiral there. That's a wave, it spirals in waves. Spirals also in hurricanes, and yes, they're also in galaxies. So from the smallest things visible to the largest things visible, uh, you have that kind of beautiful helical curve. Um, so why not just take that, take the idea of the waves, and convert that into a logo, which is where we got the, the Nautilus logo. Well, that didn't turn Nautilus around. It was performance that turned Nautilus around, and, and you know, a couple hundred people working very diligently on it. But it was, it had the, when, when it was all said and done, we had the third highest attendance in nine years, and the result was an entirely successful turnaround. We, it went from uh, red to black, we had profit and growth balanced out at over uh, $3 million. Example two is HM Web and Associates. When I came to him, that was his, his company name, but once again, just a common name. Uh, and had $8 million in annual sales, and had no logo and no tagline. So he had no communication, basically, because uh, his name really didn't mean anything. It was just who he was. No communication, what are you saying to people? 
basically a blank page. So I put this on knowing that his uh, his logo was uh, would reflect what the most visible aspect of what he did in, in HVACR, and that was pipes. He was a specialist in refrigeration, so we associated the color of the pipe with cold instead of hot. Uh, or they were cooling elements. Renamed his company to Web Technologies and created the tagline to maintain precise temperatures, which in the case of sandwich foods um, is critical to life and death. If the temperature in their cold drink changes by 10 degrees and food starts to warm up, um, it can affect the health of the food or the people eat the food. So he went from 8 to 25 million in five years after his company was re-identified, but it didn't end there. Three years later, he sold the company to uh, First Energy, a huge uh, energy company in the north, and then bought it back from them three years after that. And uh, I worked with uh, uh, David Martin of the Martin Agency to re-identify the company again. I did the design work on this job. Uh, we named the company Colonial Web, and he went from 25 million to 200 million in the next six years. So do you see what I mean when I say profitability? Howard was a shrewd businessman, and he knew how to parlay his brain in profit. It didn't happen directly off the sales of uh, heating and air conditioning system. It happened because he knew how to use a brand. First Energy didn't want to buy his company and Colonial Mechanical uh, for any other reason that he was very, uh, uh, he looked like a very good company. Um, and he had the performance to prove it. In this case, Salisbury Go Glass uh, was a company that used the Mr. Good Glass to represent the company. Mr. G is what they call him. He was one of the most poorly designed action figures I ever saw. <laughs> but it was more serious than that because Mr. Good Glass infringed Mr. Goodwrench. He got a call from General Motors with a cease and desist order. So um, he came to me with a challenge. How do we change the name without losing a million dollars of equity in advertising over the past 10 years? To make a long story short, I changed good to go. It still looked the same, still kind of sounded the same. I redesigned the action figure uh, to be a real friendly uh, Mr. Go Glass. He's, he's moving so fast with glass that his hat's always flying off, and he's friendly and fast, which is more of a benefit in glass than just good glass. Later on, we designed the Miss Go Glass to go with him. She's backing him up. Uh, she's catching his hat. Safety first. Uh, the two went together and in advertising programs to become uh, this kind of concept working together. Uh, and then 25 years later, um, not after I identified it, but uh, this was about five years after, he went uh, from one million to eight million in five years. And once again, that's profitability and branding. So to conclude our remarks, when you combine good performance with branding, you can expect profit. I would have been able to say that 20 years ago, but I can stand here and say that to you today with all the confidence that may have been um, obvious in the presentation. Um, we have a few minutes left, I think, until 9.30 for questions. I have a question. That last design of the Mr. Good glass, why did you use green and not blue? Uh, because green is the color of glass. If you look at the edge of glass, it's green. So it associates with the glass. I'll usually pick up some kind of association. And if you were to see, for example, all his auto windshields on the racks inside his, mm -hmm. um, the edges show, you look at it, take a picture of it with light in it, it's green. And I have a lot, actually, when I made these clarity marketing materials, uh, I took a lot of pictures of glass, which conformed in their color. So it is, it's not a you always hear in marketing advertising for logos and signage outside, you should always use red, blacks, and blues to get your attention. Is that true? Well, yeah, red, red, red gets attention because of the color of blood. So Coca Cola is red not because of the color of blood, but because it does get attention. And because they historically have associated with red more than any other color. Um, but blue is actually the color that people would pick as the color they like the most. Orange is the least desirable color. So, for example, if you make a poster in New York that, that is essentially blue and, and make the same poster for a Broadway play that's essentially orange, uh, you'll sell a lot fewer tickets off the orange poster than you will off the blue poster. If you want to stand out on the shelf, yellow is the color. Because you do a squint test on, on, on each shelf of merchandise and different products, all the yellow things will stand out. So you pick a color because of its association and because of how it will, will work in its environment. Uh, but there's no hard and fast rule. Somebody might want to, like FedEx might want to be purple and orange because they stand out.
Yes, sir. Um, how does a very small company, say they have sales of $100,000, uh, how do they uh, use your information and perhaps some expertise to create something? Um, I work with uh, proportionally with budgets. Um, it, it, let's say, for example, Captain Howell Brett's case, he had a bigger budget because he's a million dollar company than I came from. Right. So I spent two weeks doing logo auctions before we made the final selection. Curiously enough, we selected the first one I designed. So we could have saved all the time and money that I spent that two weeks. But we were sure. We ruled everything else out and picked this one by comparison. A smaller company, I might do three options, which is a lot less time to generate. Um, there are other things which I prefer to do, like uh, surveys and, um, and questions and answers. I do interviews, uh, which I can lengthen or shorten depending on the budget of the company. And uh, I can narrow that down to a certain minimum time period, which is much more affordable to a small company. It's not always $20,000, uh, especially with startups. Uh, but I can work a budget out reasonably for nearly any size company, including a startup that, that is working, operating on machines. Uh, look, I've been a startup 10 times over. I know what it's like. You can't spend all your money on your identity because it's not that much to perform. Yes, Somebody had a question over there. Um, I saw something on one of your screens that said naming system, and I didn't yes. know what that meant. It's name identification. Oh, right. Good question. Um, you can augment the name of a company by being a nomenclature, what's called esoteric nomenclature architecture for your company. Um, what a nomenclature system does is the same thing that McDonald's did when after they had this name McDonald's, they created the McApple Pop, uh, McFries, the Big Mac. Apple's done that with, with their Macintosh. Uh, you do that more or less to create reciprocal marketing off every term that is used to describe your products and services. This can go in a lot of different directions. I did that with Mint Design because now Everything in my company is product development, advertising mint. I no longer M E M E N T. It's always M I N T. And my uh, email address since 1995 has been Mintor M I N T O R uh, at Cox.net, and so on and so forth. So I have a nomenclature system, and what happens is you create a lot of reinforcement for the original capstone name for your communication program by adding words in that describe everything else discreetly and intelligently, but with deliberation. It's, it's a deliberate effort. That's what a naming system is. Mm -hmm. um, any, any questions? Last, last chance to take the brain of the... Somebody is clearly uh, very enthralled with the logo design and branding. It's a token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, thank you. <laughs> around and mingle and network if you have the time and the inclination.